December 29th, 2017, Netflix released an episode of Black Mirror called USS Callister, a chilling and thought-provoking episode that attempts to explore the dark side of virtual reality, the moral complexities of power, and the consequences of an unfettered ego in limitless virtual space. It's also a perfect lesson on how to be an co-written by Charlie Brooker and William Bridges. This episode was originally conceived during the filming of the playtest episode of Black Mirror and heavily inspired by an episode of The Twilight Zone called It's a Good Life that first aired on November 3rd, 1951. It also probably goes without saying that Brooker is a Trekkie. Obviously, the USS Callister tells the story of Robert Daly, a talented but disrespected software developer who creates digital replicas of his workmates and then sticks them into a virtual prison. Why? These coworkers aren't going to manipulate and control themselves. This video is going to analyze this cautionary tale and some of its concepts as experienced by Daly, a tragic villain played by none other than the talented Mr. Matt Damon. Uh, wait, what? Wait, hold on. Wait, that's not Matt Damon. Jesse Plemons. Jesse Plemons and our pro tag, Nanette Cole, is played by Christine Miliotti. Wait, hold on. Can we, can we talk about Jesse Plemons and his uncanny resemblance to Matt Damon? Also, I recommend Fargo Season 2. I'm thinking of ending things and other people if you're a Plemons fan. Man's underrated. Welcome to the Nautilus Files. I usually have this spiel that I do right about now. We're going to suspend that because this is a long video. So yeah, I expect lots of spoilers. Oh, and this is the Patreon and this is the Discord. Links are in the description. Okay, let's dive. The first time we see Daly, he's the captain of the USS Callister, a fictional space vessel in a virtual reality style video game that's been reskinned to look like throwback Star Trek. Everything from the vibrant color palette to the extreme angles used in some of the shots inside of the ship pay homage to the old school sci-fi shows from the 60s and 70s. Daly looks like he was pulled right out of a comic book as he's presented as this idealistic vision of a masculine hero who, when faced with insurmountable odds, manages to come up with a solution to save the day using his cunning wit and courage to defeat Space Patty. And of course, this is followed up by a nauseating display of bootlicking. The bridge crew can't help but fall over themselves as they all try to stand hard for this guy. But it's not long before we find out that all of this praise that we're witnessing, well, it's not genuine. Something on this scene is off. It could be the assault. It could be the choking. Ah, uh, I'm not sure. I'm not, I can't quite. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and say it's the choking. But it's clear that everyone is afraid of this guy. We see it in the brief shots of their faces that reveal that they're all freaking terrified. You also get the faux enthusiasm that the female members express as they line up for the obligatory kiss with Daly. Talk about nauseating. It's interesting to note that the co-writers, Charlie Brooker and William Bridges, mention that the original script had Plemons playing a much more dislikable version of Daly, one we were supposed to hate from the very first moment we met probably. But instead, they decided to humanize him a bit, opening up the character to a bit more of an empathetic reception from the audience. I think this was a smart choice because Plemons is great at subtlety, so playing the quiet villain is right up his alley. Anyway, the point of this scene is simple. The crew really respects Daly on this ship, the captain of the USS Callister. No question about it. Next, we're presented with the real Robert Daly. As we see him making his way to work, later on in this scene, we will learn that Robert is a genius programmer who developed Infinity, a promising online gaming platform that is currently very close to being released. But you wouldn't know that based on the way he's presented in this string of scenes. Remember, he owns the place, and as standard capitalist etiquette demands, he should be feared by his coworkers, or at least acknowledged when he steps into the room. But instead, what do we get? A sheepish Daly tries to settle into work, but along the way, we get a heap of helpful hints that indicate how Daly is perceived by his colleagues. For example, in the very first part of the scene, we watch Robert struggle to get off this elevator full of people who don't even acknowledge his existence. Then there's a scene where Shania walks right by him like he's invisible, which is followed by him falling over a bag and embarrassing himself in front of the entire office. He also runs into Packer, who is in the middle of taking a coffee order. Daly timidly requests that he makes him a coffee too. The moment ends with a subtle dig at his appearance that Packer unsuccessfully tries to save. Basically, Daly is subjected to condescending remarks, dismissive attitudes from his colleagues, they make sarcastic comments and belittle his contributions, undermining his confidence and further isolating him within the office environment. Cut to the scene where Nanette first appears. She arrives a fresh-faced new hire eager to please and just so happens to be a big fan of Daly's work. This is also the scene where we meet his partner, Walton, for the first time. Through their dialogue, it's easy to tell that Walton is Mr. Personality, 
and he's the face of the business. While Daly is seen as nothing more as just a ghost who works in the background. It's clear that Walton sees Daly as a subordinate to him, even though they are actually supposed to be partners. As this is all happening, we begin to recognize that the people that he's interacting with are the very same people we saw back on the Callister. So wait, Daly isn't the nice guy? Daly is not the good guy? This is a classic Black Mirror, the old subversion of expectations trick. It happens in almost every story. They'll take a character and place them at the center of the event, as you would any main protagonist. And of course, we side with them, but there's always that little wrinkle, that little surprise, little something something, that moment when the betrayal drops, when you realize you've been flim flam. USS Callister doesn't disappoint in this department, but there is a notable difference here because our expectations are destroyed very early in the story as opposed to the final act, which gives us all the time we need to build up a healthy distaste for Daly by the time everything wraps. Not that he needed any help in that regard. Daly has created a digital replica of his co-workers in a popular multiplayer space adventure game, but he's secretly cordoned off a little bit of that space for his own personal use. It's sort of like a pocket dimension or a sandbox. In this discreet corner of digital space, he is essentially a god because he's got all the cheat codes. He can do whatever he likes and treat any of the other simulated people inside of it any manner he pleases without any repercussion. The natural response to this is so what? It's just a video game. Nobody's getting hurt. Even so, there are obvious ethical questions raised here. Watching it again reminded me of the real life deepfakes that we see today. Copies of real people that are created and consumed mostly without the permission of the subject. I can say that Daly's co-workers would not be okay with his little side project if they found out. Granted, this is still kind of a fuzzy area. We're only beginning to address this in the real world. We can identify some similarities between the deepfake situation and what's going on in the USS Callister, but there is one more important distinction that makes things a little bit more complicated for us in this story. And that's because for all intents and purposes, these simulations can feel emotions, just like real people. We're given a clear indication of this when we watch our pro tag Nanette enter Daly's infinity space for the first time. During this first meeting, we learned that all of the crew can recall the events of their previous lives on the outside before they were inserted into the game. They have full working memories, just like the audience. This opens up the door for us to relate to these characters as real people. We also learn that they're trapped in this game world indefinitely, and that's because that's what Daly wants. He wants to keep them there, to use as playthings in his weird cosplay fantasy. The key thing to note here is that if these simulations have emotions, then they certainly have dreams, aspirations, and goals, just like anyone else. And Daly knows this. He's fully aware of this fact, and that is precisely what makes him a monster. When he's at the office, he's a mild-mannered, stereotypical nerd with an awkward handle on social interactions. At night, he turns into a sadistic monster, willing to dish out pain at even the slightest provocation on any of his co-workers slash bridge crew. And by provocation, I mean looking at him funny. Oh yeah, and he had the forethought to make sure that none of the crew have any <coughs> parts. Just another example of him taking that extra step to deny them of any pleasure. And it buttresses the point that Daly doesn't see them as anything more than a means to an end, an extension of his own pleasure. It turns out that these two seemingly different sides aren't sides at all, as the story begins to reveal that they do indeed bleed into each other. Robert Daly is a blurred aberration, a mix of both Jekyll and Hyde. We can see the dark version of himself lurking just behind that nice guy facade at several moments in the office. There are indications of a devious mind when he's absolutely seething with jealousy at the sight of Nicole talking to Walton. You get the sense of his feeling of entitlement and ownership. It's almost as if he felt Nicole was stolen from him. This attitude that he has where he sees other people as objects, just an extension of himself, is a major part of why he's able to be so cruel. Daly's problem is apathy. He's in so deep that it's taken over his life. His fragile ego and deep-seated insecurities have completely disfigured his sense of self. And this Captain character, well, that's the manifestation of this new identity. If you give a deeply insecure person a whole lot of power, they're very likely to use that power to compensate for their own perceived shortcomings in a big way. And in the process, probably do a lot of harm, especially to anyone that challenges that perceived self-image. We see this happening in the real world all of the time. I can think of a few perfect examples, as I'm sure you can too. In Daly's case, though, we see his worst inclinations come forward as he bullies the crew with threats, physical assaults, and torture. Initially, it's shocking to see a guy who presents himself so humbly behave this way, but the story does a great job of shining a light on the dynamic and how it really works. When we're talking about power in a digital world, 
things can get even more complicated because these spaces are not as limited as the constraints that restrict us in the physical world. The rules can be bent, especially by the powerful, but with even more wide-reaching effects or outsized impact. In USS Callister, this plays out in a small place with just a handful of individuals, but it doesn't take much time to imagine what Daly would do if he could control massive amounts of people. Daly's actions in the virtual realm stem from a desire for validation and respect, but of course, he never gets that respect, so he turns to his virtual world to fulfill this fantasy, where he can get the adoration he feels he deserves. This is a reminder that when ego fuels the desire for power, it can result in a disconnection from one's identity. When you cannot see yourself, you cannot see others. One of the most telling scenes is the part where he's standing over this defeated Khan ultimate warrior mashup of a villain, also of course another one of his co-workers. This man has been stuck playing the villain and has no doubt suffered several excruciating and hum and humiliating defeats. I'm sure he's over it. In fact, he's so desperate that he begs Daly to end his life, hoping to appeal to his better nature because he's been such a good performer up until now. Daly thinks about it, but ultimately decides to spare him. He tells himself that he's being a cool guy for doing so, and I don't doubt that he believes that this is true. The reality is that sparing this guy's life is actually cruel. Again, his ego has distorted reality, so Daly lives in a world where everything and everyone exists for his pleasure and at his will. All the while, this dulls his sense of humanity. Now, I want to talk about the Nanette character, because her story arc is the main point of conflict with Dailies, even though her character doesn't develop that much throughout the story. The way I see it, Nanette exists to elucidate the point that empathy is the answer to apathy. In the office, when Nanette is first introduced to Daly, she immediately geeks out at the idea of meeting someone she's idolized. Nanette genuinely looks up to Daly as a developer, as a professional. This is completely normal behavior. This, no doubt, piques Daly's interest in her because he's finally found someone in the office that sees him the way he sees himself. And just like that, he's switched on. Of course, the fact that she's much younger and attractive doesn't hurt, but the speed at which this man becomes possessive of her is pretty scary. Nicole is there to work, nothing more. She says it herself in the conversation with Shania. I will say that I appreciate the writers keeping this in the story because it reflects the real experiences of so many women in what should be professional settings. How did things go for digital Nanette? Well, much worse. Much, much worse. Digital Nanette, some of us prefer the term Audi is the new kid in class. She hasn't been trapped in this game world long enough to be jaded and has yet to resign herself to a miserable life like the rest of the crew. She's here to fight. When Nicole attempts to defy Daly for the first time, he tortures her into submission. Having your whole face wiped away is enough to get most people to chill, but Cole is built different. She won't give up, and that fight that's in her is what lights the fire under the rest of the crew's collective butts. Nicole's other strength is how she is able to bond with the rest of the crew, and in doing so, she creates a feeling of mutual obligation between members of the bridge. This is essential to escaping because on their own, no one person in the group is strong enough to take on daily. This attitude, the one where she sees other people as human beings that are worthy of dignity and respect, is the reason she is capable of being so magnanimous. Without the infectious effects of hope and solidarity, the crew's incredible risky plan to jailbreak by manipulating Nicole's real-life counterpart into helping them would never have worked. Shania, Walker, Judani, Packer, Elena aren't convinced, nor would they have been willing to stick their necks out in such an unsafe bet without Nicole's positive influence on the group. It's the reason Shania takes one for Nicole, and the reason Walton decided that roasting himself alive to repair the ship is worth the sacrifice. The closing scene leaves us with a sense of triumph and redemption. The crew members now, free from Daly's control, embark on a new journey where they can find their own destinies. USS Callister serves as a cautionary tale about the dangers of unchecked power, the importance of empathy, and the resilience of the human spirit. It reminds us that even in the darkest corners of virtual reality, humanity can prevail. That's it for this episode. I'm not sure why this one took so long to write. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed it. I'd love to hear your opinion. The new season is coming soon, and when it does, I would like to cover it. I'm going to have to try to find a way to fit all of this into the schedule, but we'll get it done. Anyway, that's it for now. Take care of yourselves. Be good to one another. I'll see you guys in the next one. Off you go.